Okay, well, hello and welcome to our program today. My name is Corey Williams and I work here at the Fayetteville Public Library and I'm so happy to virtually see you all here. Um, one little housekeeping note to reduce, uh, reduce the background noise and interruptions, please keep your microphones muted and use the chat area for questions and comments. And thank you in advance for that. And I'm delighted to welcome Eric Fusilet as our presenter this evening. Uh, Dr. Smith was supposed to be joining us, but she wasn't able to come. So Eric is graciously filling in. Um, and he actually kicked off our entire American Wetlands series. So he's going to be doing our final one tonight, which is kind of fun. And he'll be discussing um, the wetlands and climate change. And Eric, thank you so much for being here tonight. Yeah, thank you, Corey, I appreciate it. Um, glad that it uh, kind of worked out. Uh, I was able to fill in, so I already had a presentation uh, that was pretty much put together so on this topic, so it kind of worked out. Um, so yeah, um, if you haven't seen uh, the <clears throat> presentation I gave a couple of weeks ago, then, um, or if you have seen it, I should say, there's going to be a, a small amount of overlap, mostly in the introduction, but uh, if not, then um, this should be it should be fine. So we'll just go ahead and get started here. But basically, we're we'll talking about the interplay between wetlands and climate change and how the two kind of affect each other. So, all right. So basically, we're going to start off basic. What is a wetland? Well, a wetland, these are areas that are inundated or saturated by surface or groundwater at a frequency and duration sufficient to support a prevalence of vegetation that is typically adapted for life in saturated soil conditions. Another way to think about it is these are transition areas between land that is permanently wet and land that is permanently dry. And so if you saw my presentation a couple of weeks ago, this first part is going to, this introductory part is going to be pretty much the same. So we're going to have a little overlap, but to give you kind of some examples of wetlands, uh, river deltas, where rivers are kind of meeting uh, larger bodies of water or the ocean, you know, these, uh, the, like the photo you see here, there's this land area, and then as the river level goes up, it's going to flood these areas, and so you won't see this land exposed, but eventually that water level goes down and the land becomes exposed again, so vegetation that uh, lives uh, in the especially adapted to these types of habitats are able to handle saturated soil, some species are able to handle that inundation, periodic inundation, um, or sometimes permanent flooding, uh, but they're all rooted vegetation as opposed to some deep water aquatic uh, plant species, which are going to have floating roots or floating um, foliage and that sort of thing and are more adapted to deeper water. So wetland vegetation is typically about the size of the uh, terrestrial vegetation. It's just adapted to these transition areas. Um, between land that is permanently wet and permanently dry. Another example of areas where we find wetlands are in estuaries. This is where you have a, a freshwater river that's meeting a saltwater system and some of that uh, brackish saltwater kind of backs up into the estuary and then due to uh, fluctuating water levels, you will have wetlands in these uh, locations. <clears throat> Marshes, these are gonna be uh, places with predominantly herbaceous vegetation, uh, you know, as opposed to woody vegetation. Uh, and these are going to be along coasts and areas, um, you know, uh, saltwater marshes. So whenever, you know, the tide comes in, water levels go up, uh, inundates these areas, or, you know, storm surges, that sort of thing uh, will bring water into these marshes, these coastal marshes, and then eventually that water level will go back down. Another type of wetland swamps, this is one we might be more familiar with inland. Uh, there are coastal swamps as well. Uh, these are going to, of course, be uh, flooded forests. These are, have uh, woody vegetation um, with trees. Um, two common trees that you find in the swamps here in Arkansas are going to be your bald cypress and your uh, tupelo. Uh, both of those species will form those knees that are uh, very characteristic of freshwater swamps. And uh, the water levels, you know, depending on the source of hydrology for these, whether it's <clears throat> some of them border rivers. And so as water levels go up in the river, they flood these swampy areas. Some of them are on oxbows, uh, especially in the Mississippi River alluvial valley. Uh, and so they're, you know, can be either seasonally flooded or periodically flooded. Bogs and fins, uh, these are going to be more of your open areas, uh, depending on the source of hydrology and, and as well as the pH there is going to determine 
uh, whether or not it is a bog or fin and have an impact on the plant communities. And then there are some wetlands that are more seasonal. You know, these uh, will be dry part of the year uh, and you'll go out uh, or you may just, uh, may just have a high water table uh, to where uh, you may never have any inundation. And so whenever that, uh, during the spring and the wet season, that water table comes up and it never rises above the surface, but it gets close enough to the surface to support uh, predominantly hydrophytic vegetation. But the rest of the year, it may be dry and you might not know unless you know how to identify the vegetation and how to uh, look for hydric soil indicators of the soil. Then there are prairie potholes. These are uh, dominant up there in the northern Great Plains, um, North Dakota, southern Canada area. Uh, these are seasonal or ephemeral wetlands, very important for migrating waterfowl. They go up there in the springtime when the uh, spring rains fill up these uh, pothole areas with water. They breed there, raise their young before heading south uh, whenever it starts to become winter again. But during the dry season, these will dry up. So these are what are considered ephemeral wetlands. They're only around during uh, the wet season. So what about some common types of wetlands we have here in Northwest Arkansas? Well, most of the wetlands we have here are gonna be pretty small. Uh, we don't have the larger swamps like they do in the Eastern Arkansas. In effect, the wetlands here in Northwest Arkansas only cover about one and a half to 2% of the land in our region. Uh, one example is gonna be our wet prairies. Uh, this is a, a pic photo of uh, Woolsey Wet Prairie over on the west side of Fayetteville. Uh, these are, you know, there's, these are, were once much more common. Uh, we've developed some of these, <clears throat> but these are basically prairies where you have uh, either seasonal water uh, due to water collecting in low areas or water table coming up uh, and flooding certain parts of these and they'll support uh, predominantly hydrophytic vegetation. Uh, be, uh, these ephemeral wetlands are also very important for uh, amphibians that might rely on you know, these like vernal pools and whatnot uh, uh, to uh, have places for their eggs, little nurseries or habitat. Uh, and that way, and then by the time they're drying up, uh, these eggs have hatched and they become adult uh, salamanders or uh, frogs. Here's an example of a wet prairie in Bentonville. This is taken over south of uh, 14th Street over in the wet west part of town. Um, it's a pretty large area uh, with, uh, you can see this uh, darker area. This is uh, just organic matter, it's kind of built up. Uh, this uh, was taken in the early spring before we had gotten a lot of rain. And so a lot of it was still was a little bit drier, or at least the soil was still moist and saturated, but there wasn't as much standing water. If you went out there now, you might be a little more standing water. And we also have wet glades. Glades are areas where the bedrock is very close to the soil surface. So that bedrock is a restrictive layer. You know, oftentimes uh, water, you know, the groundwater table is perched on top of that bedrock. Uh, so when we have uh, the type of uh, karst topography that we have here in the Ozarks, you know, whether they, it be a spring that is coming out into that glade area or um, some other form, uh, maybe like a seep of some kind, uh, it will just kind of sit there on top of that bedrock and keep the soil saturated even throughout uh, the growing season. And so that will support a special kind of plant community when within these certain uh, specific types of glades. Not all glades are wet glades, but we do have some that are. And then seeps, these are where groundwater is kind of uh, seeping out um, through that karst topography, through our, you know, porous geography or geology that we have underneath us where we have, you know, caves and springs and whatnot and the groundwater is kind of moving, uh, kind of like Swiss cheese is one analogy they give for that karst of uh, geology. Uh, but a uh, difference between a seep and a spring where as a spring is going to come out in a single point, seeps tend to kind of come out in a more diffuse area. Uh, so it's a little more seepage as opposed to, you know, a, a single point where that groundwater is exiting the, the the uh, subterranean environment. Here's an example of a seep uh, in Fayetteville over on the uh, west side of, or I'm sorry, the um, north side of Mount Kessler. Uh, here's one in southern Washington County over at Blackburn Bluffs um, Preserve, which is managed by the Northwest Arkansas Land Trust. I actually took a video, I wish I had included the video, but you can actually see the water is kind of flowing out of the seep. Uh, it's just this big wet area that water is diffusely flowing. You know, they had enough rain that there was a flow uh, the day that I took that photo. 
And then we have these lacustrine fringes. These are often going to be uh, associated with the edges of uh, deep water habitats like lakes, uh, ponds. So this is a photo of a lacustrine wetland along the edge of Beaver Lake. Now, if you recall, like if the lake, if we get a lot of rain, a lot of rain water drains into the lake, you know, the lake level goes up. And then occasionally they have to let water out of the dam or when it gets hot, hot water evaporates and the lake level goes down. Well, along the edge of the lake, you get with that undulating water level, you're going to have specific vegetation that is able that is adapted to those alternating water levels. So it can handle the periodic inundation or periodic soil saturation, uh, but it's also um, terrestrial, still considered a terrestrial vegetation or a hydrophyte. Um, and so this is what makes it a wet land since it uh, represents that transition between permanently wet and permanently dry environments. Uh, we also have fringe wetlands uh, around the edges of ponds. And this is one over in Benton County. Um, this was taken early spring. So uh, you can see the fescue is green because that's a cool season grass. So it's typically green throughout the winter, but um, the uh, Ludwigia that you see there in the foreground is still brown because it's, uh, it's left over from last year. But uh, a lot of ponds have the same uh, you know, type of behavior, if you will, as a lake where the water levels go up and down depending on heat, evapo evaporation rates, evapotranspiration rates, uh, with the plants uh, transpiring uh, water as well as um, water coming in to that water body. There's another pond in Fayetteville. Uh, this is over uh, near Kessler Mountain Regional Park. You see in the foreground, I, well, I took this photo in February, so the vegetation was not very green, but you can see in the foreground is what's called soft rush or juncus effusus, and in the background is uh, some uh, American lotus. So, um, but uh, this is an area where uh, along the edge, the water stays inundated and it's able to uh, support that hydrophytic vegetation and then the water level will later go down. Uh, here's an example of a, a fringe wetland along a pond in Bentonville. Again, with the juncus effusus, I took this a little later in the year and you can start to see it starting to green up there uh, here in this area. And then we have riparian wetlands. These are gonna be along edges of stream banks, uh, especially when that stream bank is within the floodplain. And so whenever that uh, water level goes up, you know, it floods out into the floodplain and then the vegetation, if it ha that happens often enough, you're going to get special vegetation there that is able to handle that periodic inundation. And these are the type of wetlands that account for most of the wetland acreage in our region. And, you know, we don't have these huge swampy areas like they do in Eastern Arkansas, but we do have a lot of streams and these water levels will go up onto the floodplains and uh, create these wetlands here in Northwest Arkansas. And I'll explain a little bit of why these are important here in a bit, but here's a photo of, uh, that's me taking some notes out at a uh, riparian wetland along Clabber Creek. This is just downstream of the Wilson Springs Preserve. And as you can see, it's, it's pretty flooded there. Uh, here's a riparian wetland uh, along the creek. I believe this might be Osage Creek. It's that Southwest 28th Street in Bentonville that you see in the background with the cars crossing. I took this photo after we had all the flooding uh, a few weeks ago uh, went out and you can see how all that vegetation has been pushed over. Uh, you can see how the bank is pretty low down uh, to the creek. So that is part of the floodplain. So when that creek level goes up, uh, that you know stuff stays underwater and the groundwater table, which is typically you know close to where you see the, the top of the surface water in the creek, you can see how that's gonna be pretty close, um, not too far underground for where these plants are growing. So if you extend that water table from the, you know, level of the creek over, um, that's typically where the water table is going to be. All right, so how, do, how does climate change impact wetlands? So let's just talk a little bit about the different variables of climate change and the impact that that would have on wetlands. So what about temperature changes? Well, climate change, uh, such as drought, uh, the effects of climate change such as drought, warmer temperatures and changing precipitation patterns can all affect the health and beneficial functionality of wetlands. I mean, wetlands are, uh, they're dependent on water. You know, they need water for them to do their thing to support the vegetation. So, you know, when we have drought, warmer temperatures where that water is evaporating and there's less water and then of course that's gonna affect the health of that wetland ecosystem. Also warmer temperatures drought 
And change in precipitation patterns can increase evapotranspiration and lead to water losses. So changes in the timing and amount of precipitation will result in more frequent drying and or flooding. Uh, one of the things that they are expecting uh, in this region from climate change is periods of drought and then periods of heavy rainfall like we saw a few weeks ago. Uh, this affects both the quantity and quality of the water supply which wetland ecosystems depend on. Uh, and it not only affects the e wetland ecosystems but also their buffer communities. So these buffer communities, these are these uh, upland ecosystems or upland um, plant communities that are um, on the edge of the wetland community systems. And these buffer um, communities, um, they offer all kinds of benefits to, you know, protecting um, these wetland ecosystems from runoff, so a down runoff, or, you know, they, they act as kind of um, the first wall of defense, so to speak, for these wetland ecosystems. So changes in temperatures and precipitation are also going to uh, they expect it to affect upland plant communities uh, where, should, where these upland trees are going to experience a higher mortality uh, due to climate change. All right, so what about the impacts on the soil? Well, drought and wetland disturbance uh, is expected to result in a loss of carbon stored in the soil, which will in turn result in changes to the soil structure. You know, car, uh, a lot of soil organic matter serves as you know, glue that kind of helps clump up some soil and create pore space so that water can filter down through. Are you okay? Can't help this it's, it's all okay. Um, so, um, and I'll talk here in a little bit about how we're gonna, uh, the impact uh, or how water helps with uh, carbon, uh, storing carbon and just creating these anoxic conditions uh, and how that, uh, help sequester carbon. So whenever we lose these anoxic conditions, uh, or, um, when you start getting more oxygen into these areas when they're less wet, uh, it's gonna increase the rate of decomposition of the organic matter that was once being sequestered in these wetland ecosystems. Also drought uh, is gonna increase events such as wildflowers, which can also alter water quality and the structure and function of wetlands and watersheds. So, um, you're already seeing, they're already in severe drought out west, uh, and they're already starting to see some bad wildfire, wildfires. And if you recall, we had some bad droughts here in the Ozarks several years ago, and there was some wildfires out near the Buffalo region area in Boxley Valley. Uh, so as we start to see drier climates during the summer times, this might be a little bit more of our common experience like they have out west. All right, what about wetlands and sea level rise? If we're having uh, more uh, glacier melt and um, ice cap melt, then <clears throat> when the sea levels rise, many scientists predict that that rapid rate of sea level rise will outpace the evolutionary adaptive capacity of coastal wetland flora and fauna. So heavy development pressures in most of these coastal areas is gonna restrict the ability of wetlands to naturally migrate inward. You know, they talk about how certainly a large percentage of our human population lives along coast. You know, back whenever, you know, before, you know, when a lot of things and goods and stuff were traded by seas and boats and whatnot, and people live in ports, and, you know, and this is where a lot of development has historically occurred. Uh, so uh, this development, um, you know, is going to, or, you know, whereas if this development was not here, then these ecosystems would have been able to uh, somewhat, you uh, move inward uh, to adapt to these rising sea levels, but uh, development pressure is gonna make that much more difficult. The coastal communities are being heavily damaged from extreme storm events and sea level rise, and these inland communities such as ourselves are being impacted by severe flooding and drought. So without these coastal wetlands, whether they be swamps, whether they be uh, marshes, to be, able, to be able to handle that sea level rise and these storm surges, uh, we're going to see a lot more flooding in our um, urban environments along the coast, such as we've already have started to see in this century, becoming much more common. And then we think about the cumulative impacts of all this. Uh, climate changes in combination with other stressors, such as land development, which may further exacerbate the loss of wetlands. Like I mentioned, most of the wetlands here in northwest Arkansas are pretty small. Uh, we don't have really huge ones, but we have 
uh, you know, enough that are small enough uh, that the more they get developed, the more impervious surfaces we have, the more uh, runoff that we're going to have during these heavy storm events. And then there's less uh, water being stored in these wetlands during the drought. Uh, so the, you know, the groundwater recharge uh, that these wetlands, even the small ones help provide, uh, isn't there uh, to help sustain creek flows during the uh, uh, spring, I mean, during the summer and the dry season, uh, as well as uh, groundwater for, you know, certain endangered species of the Ozark cave fish. All right, so how uh, do wetlands help mitigate the human causes of climate change? And this is where we're really going to get into some carbon sequestration. So plants, you know, when they, through photosynthesis, they take in carbon dioxide, right? They take it in through the stomata on the underside of their leaves. Uh, then they take up H2O from their roots and then use photosynthesis to, you know, combine these, break it apart, and put them together to create glucose. And what they have left over afterwards is oxygen, O2. And so that's why they exhale uh, oxygen. Um, you know, and then humans and other animals like ourselves, we inhale oxygen. Uh, and exhale carbon dioxide. But uh, whenever these plants are taking in CO2, uh, they're incorporated into the biomass, especially if they're uh, woody species like trees, and they're able to build that biomass in their woody, woody species. You just sit down, thanks for Sorry, I got my five-year-old here with me. Um, so uh, what happens though, <clears throat> is when these plants eventually die, uh, and like a tree falls down and it uh, sinks to the bottom of the wetland where it stays waterlogged and you have these anoxic conditions without, because um, whenever you have these permanently saturated soils, the usually the oxygen level in these areas are very, very low. And so uh, that slows down the rate of decomposition of the organic matter or the plant material. Because uh, uh, the, the microorganisms that live in these anoxic conditions metabolize much, much slower than um, or microorganisms that live in a more aerated environment. So the rate of decomposition is happening much, much slower than the rate at which uh, more uh, carbon and organic matter is being added. So that's why wetland soils tend to be very, very dark, very, very high in organic matter. And that's why you know, several hundred years ago, people, and even as recent as 100 years ago, people were draining these wetlands uh, and turning them into agricultural lands because that, uh, that soil is very, very fertile. It's been accumulating organic matter for uh, centuries or millennia. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, so when we get rid of these wetlands, we're losing the, the carbon sequestration uh, uh, that they're able to help uh, mitigate some of the, a lot of the carbon that we're putting out um, through uh, burning fossil fuels. All right, so coastal wetlands are estimated to sequester twice as much carbon in their soil than all the tropical forests. So think about that. A younger freshwater wetland, which is going to be more inland, and disturbed wetlands can emit carbon until they can develop sufficiently to a certain stage when they are starting to Sequestion, sequester carbon. So older freshwater wetlands where you're going to have a lot more trees, uh, you know, these are due to forest succession. These, you know, probably started off one day as a uh, more um, emergent wetland like we saw, or freshwater wetland like we saw in this uh, picture here. But as uh, the plant communities develop and go through different successional stages and they get to that forest stage, and not only are they uh, sequestering carbon in the soil, they're also sequestering carbon in the biomass of the trees as well. But, uh, a lot of the difference between the ability of uh, tropical forests to sequester carbon is they're limited by the limit that those trees uh, can grow. You know, they can only grow so high, there can only be so much. And so once they reach that limit, you know, they, you know, effectively aren't able to sequester any more carbon. Whereas in the wetland soils, because um, organic matter is accumulating faster than it's being decomposed, uh, that can uh, hypothetically just continue and continue to uh, build up organic matter and um, uh, keep, continue to sequester this carbon. All right, so what about wetlands and uh, adaptation to climate change? How can wetlands help us as a society adapt to climate change? And this is gonna be a lot with 
had to do with the, the ecosystem services that wetlands provide. Well, what are ecosystem services? These are the many and varied benefits that the natural environment provides to human society. So when we're talking about the ecosystem services provided by wetlands and how they could help with our ability to adapt to climate change, this is specifically gonna be their role in the hydrologic cycle, their ability to improve water quality, and also the habitat that they're providing for fish, wildlife, and native plants. So climate change is expected to result in changes to the hydrologic cycle, including alter precipitation and snowmelt patterns. Well, wetlands uh, could all help offset these changes by storing water and reducing the effects of storms, uh, of, I mean, of droughts and severe storms. Wetlands are often likened to a giant sponge. After a heavy rainfall, uh, they are able to soak up and hold, uh, store a lot of the storm water and then release it slowly. Um, you know, especially as our, the amount of impervious surfaces it continues to expand as our region continues to grow, stormwater has to go somewhere if it's not able to be soaked into the ground. So where does it go? It goes sideways uh, to the edge of the street, to the nearest storm drain. And then, you know, when you get a lot of this, this flash flooding like we saw uh, a couple weeks ago. So where these wetlands are able to help capture uh, the flow of the surface water and then gradually release it after the peak flood flows have passed. Um, so but through this, they're able to reduce the frequency and intensity of floods by absorbing and storing significant amounts of stormwater, which helps reduce property damage and erosion downstream. So here's a picture, a photo that was uh, out there in the paper last a couple weeks ago. This was uh, taken across the interstate from my office. Uh, this was a lot of flooding that occurred. Um, and this is just an example of climate change increasing storm intensity, resulting in increased stormwater runoff. Like I mentioned earlier, the impervious surfaces block rain from soaking into the ground. And this increases the amount of runoff going sideways. So when you get urban areas where we have higher concentration of these impervious surfaces, that runoff is going to flow at higher speeds and in larger quantities, leading to flash flooding. This is a photo taken by Christopher Paxton, the floodplain manager for the city of Rogers. Um, a lot of people probably recognize this creek, uh, but this is a kind of flash flooding uh, that we um, might start to see a little more often. Uh, and we have been seeing a lot more often here in the past several years. So again, this accelerates stream bank erosion downstream, which increases the turbidity levels of the water. And if you don't know what turbidity is, that is basically the amount of suspended sediment floating in the water, so which is harmful to aquatic ecosystems. For one thing, when you have uh, dirty, murky water, uh, light is not able to penetrate the water, qual uh, the co water column deeply enough to facilitate photosynthesis uh, of the algae in that water. And like I said, what happens with photosynthesis is plants are exhaling oxygen. So when the algae in the water are able to photosynthesize, uh, they're uh, able to put dissolved oxygen into the water that fish and other aquatic organisms need to breathe, uh, such as macroinvertebrates, insect larvae, that sort of thing. Uh, so when there's less um, photosynthetic activity, uh, they uh, will start to suffocate. Uh, another uh, potential bad thing, another potential uh, negative effect of the turbidity levels in the stream as the soil uh, particles can launch into the gills of the, the fish and uh, prevent their ability to take an oxygen level uh, through there too. So when wetlands act as these natural sponges by capturing and slowing down the flow of surface water and then gradually release it, uh, this uh, helps with not only reducing the frequency and intensity of floods by absorbing significant amounts of storm water, but uh, the tree roots and mats and other wetland vegetation help slow down the speed of these flood waters, distributes them more slowly over the floodplains, so that way it's less intense and less concentrated in the streams. So this combined water storage and breaking action lowers flood heights and reduces erosion. And also when it's able to be stored in these wetlands for longer, that uh, turbidity or sediment will have more time to settle out and settle to the bottom of the wetland. So the cumulative presence of wetlands and lakes in a watershed can reduce flood flows during these big storm event, uh, events. So when you have a, even a lot of small wetlands, they can have a cumulative effect uh, to act as a giant wetland in a region. 
The wetlands within and downstream of urban areas are particularly valuable, counteracting greatly increased rate and volume of surface water runoff and pavement and buildings. Here's a photo of, uh, this is Eastern Arkansas. This is at the White River National Wildlife Refuge, but just to kind of give an example, the bottomland hardwood riparian wetlands along the Mississippi River are, what, are thought to have once stored at least 60 days of flood water. However, now they're uh, estimated to only store 12 days because most have been filled or drained. Coastal wetlands and marshes help buffer the storm surge from hurricanes. So whenever we are seeing a lot of these uh, wetlands go away like it's uh, happening in South Louisiana, we're gonna see these um, storm surges that are gonna get further inland and do more property damage because the, the wetland vegetation isn't able to help slow down. Uh, they're not, the wetlands aren't able to store that storm water. And so it's gonna have more of an impact on uh, society. Not only that, but I mentioned that wetlands are also a source of surface and groundwater recharge in uh, the drying landscape. So uh, during the dry summer months, uh, when these, these wetlands are holding water, they're able to help contribute to the groundwater table. And so when you get perennial and intermittent streams, a lot of the source of these is coming up from the bottom of these types of streams. Uh, it is fed in part by groundwater. Uh, so whenever the groundwater table goes down, and it goes down below the bottom of the stream bank, I mean, the, the stream bed, uh, that's when you see an intermittent stream dry up. Uh, perennial streams are the type that stay uh, flowing year round. However, uh, some of these perennial streams might uh, not be able to sustain flows if that groundwater table uh, is, you know, continues to go down during the drier months and uh, stop, uh, is, isn't able to, um, isn't able to uh, continue to feed uh, that water uh, to the stream. Um, so, so they help keep waters flowing in streams, which helps offset the effects of summer droughts on aquatic species. So think about these aquatic species living in these uh, ecosystems uh, that require this water, uh, or at least a you know, complete part or all of their life cycle. And without that water, they're not gonna be able to do that. Not only that, but groundwater recharge, I'm sorry, uh, but they're also able to help out with uh, water quality, improving water quality. I mean, wetlands are called the kidneys of the landscape uh, because of that ability to help filter and purify water. So increased stormwater runoff carries more contaminants that are harmful to water quality, aquatic ecosystems, and other wildlife. Uh, think about all the drippings from cars. Oh, one second. Uh, you think about all these drippings that happen from cars, um, like automobile fluids, oil and whatnot, it drips onto the surface of the, um, you know, the pavement. And when these rains come along, it, you know, dislodges that uh, or dissolve, you know, starts to pick up some of these contaminants and carries it along in the streams. So this is uh, these, you know, where do they go? They go to the nearest, um, nearest aquatic ecosystem and they have negative impacts on the things that live there. Also, when the flow of surface water is slowed down or contained, like I mentioned earlier, sediment has more time to settle out uh, and settle to the bottom. And so that helps reduce uh, the turbidity, le turbidity levels of water after uh, heavy storm, storm events. So wetlands can help improve water quality of nearby rivers and streams by eliminating many pollutants before they reach our local drinking water sources. So, and through the cycles of wetting and drying, combined with the bacteria and plants that live in these habitats, wetlands can sequester, alter, and or assimilate a, a contaminants such as excess nutrients, heavy metals, and petroleum products. And if you saw my presentation a couple of weeks ago, I went into a little bit more in depth on the specific species and the specific contaminants that they're able to help uh, remediate. But uh, just know that uh, a lot of these wetland ecosystems are uh, helping to uh, purify water, uh, break down contaminants uh, to make uh, our drinking water cleaner. So their role in water quality management will contribute to our ability to adapt to climate change. Not only that, but wetlands are a uh, provide wildlife habitat. Like I mentioned the vernal pools earlier and their importance with migrating waterfowl. 
Uh, wetlands provide food, habitat, and shelter for many species of birds, fish, insects, amphibians, reptiles, and other wildlife. Uh, wetlands are some of the most biologically productive ecosystems in the world. Uh, a third, it's estimated that a third of threatened endangered species in the lower 48 states live only in wetlands. An additional 20% use or inhabit wetlands at some time in their life cycles. And so wetlands are going to help provide refuge from the effects of climate change for many species. They provide amphibians refuge from heat and drought. Wetlands also help reduce the effects of drought and heat have on other wildlife by providing a source of water or moist, cool microclimates. Uh, as the climate changes, wetlands also provide a corridor or stepping stone on the landscape that may help species move to better areas. So the loss of wetlands can also lead to reduced habitat for fish and wildlife uh, and, worsening existing, uh, and worsening existing shifts in species ranges. So species that were once uncommon in an area may be encountered more frequently as their ranges shift with climate change. A local issue of concern is the Ozark cavefish. This is one that depends on groundwater being in the underground subterranean environment in the caves. Um, so if we don't have the wetlands that are contributing to that groundwater recharge um, and we're having more um, impervious surfaces that's causing less water to soak into the ground, more of it to run off, uh, that's going to be less uh, water that is uh, there to support these Ozark Cape fish populations. Not only that, but because of their biodiversity, these ecosystems are often popular places for recreational activities such as fishing, hunting, birding, uh, hiking, uh, and photography. So think about this newly opened Osage Park in Bentonville. Uh, this is one that has just recently opened to the public. I really encourage you to go out there and check it out. It has a boardwalk trail uh, through the wetland area. Woolsey Wet Prairie also open to the public. It's a wildlife sanctuary. It's a great, a popular destination for birders and botanists and herpetologists alike. Um, the University of Arkansas also uses it uh, for research uh, for the herpetology department. Uh, Wilson Springs Preserve in Fayetteville. Uh, this is um, a large wetland area. If you go out, they often have to, it's managed by the land trust and they often have to close it down uh, after a heavy rain of it because it will flood and it, you know, it's uh, not accessible at that point. But it is providing a lot of um, those ecosystem services for the people that live uh, in the neighborhoods around it and downstream and preventing uh, the flood waters from getting into their houses or causing erosion on their own properties. And then there is uh, a wetland down uh, south, uh, south east of town, uh, kind of out towards West Fork, but still in Fayetteville along Dead Horse Mountain Road. This one is being managed by the Watershed Conservation Resource Center. They're preserving 98 acres south of Huntsville Road along the West Fork of the White River at the southeast edge of town. I apologize. The center is a nonprofit in the city that focuses on watershed restoration and education. Uh, and they do have plans to make it uh, uh, the land accessible to visitors. So uh, once they do that, I really encourage you to go out and um, go visit this wetland area. Uh, and I mentioned recreation and tourism. One of the things that we've done with the South Central Chapter, the Society of Wetland Scientists is uh, organize these educational events for the public. In 2019, we organized a wetland ecology tour. Uh, a year before that, we had the Northwest Arkansas birding tour, uh, where we invited the public out to come look at these various uh, wetland areas and uh, learn more about the uh, flora and fauna uh, that uh, depend on these habitats to live. So um, then we held these as fundraisers uh, for our chapter. Uh, and then this, um, um, yeah, okay, <laughs> forgot what I was gonna say. But here are some photos from some of these events. We have on the right, um, some photos from the Wetland Ecology Tour, and on the left, some photos from the, the birding tour where uh, uh, Joe Nill led a group of about 40 people uh, to go uh, see the birds out the Charlie Craig Fish Hatchery, which is fed by springs. So these activities help stimulate local econ economies. They bring visitors to locally owned stores, restaurants, and hotels, resulting in additional income for these businesses, as well as a tax benefit to cities. 
Uh, think about eastern Arkansas, the wetlands there and their importance to waterfowl and uh, the recreational um, activities that, from all the, uh, the duck hunters that go out there during duck season and all the income that they're bringing uh, to the local small little towns in that region. And so this is the point I really want to drive home in this whole uh, series here that we're doing is the importance of wetlands. And uh, I want to really want to point out that we have already lost a significant number of the wetlands in our country. If I recall, I mentioned how a lot of them uh, were previously drained because of the fertile soils uh, that they had and they're used for agriculture. And it's estimated that since the 1700s, the United States has lost over 50% of our wetland resources. So here is uh, an aerial photograph of Northwest Arkansas in 1984. And I want you to compare that with the aerial photograph of 2018 and look at how much more impervious surfaces we have now than we did. And they're expecting our region to continue growing. Uh, we're not finished growing. So, uh, you know, we really wanna drive this point home that the wetlands that we have left, we really need to think about how we grow and develop uh, to do so responsibly, ethically, uh, and to make sure that we're not creating more of these flash flood events that were not taking away uh, water from these habitats that not only are important to uh, wildlife uh, and aquatic uh, organisms, but they also provide a benefit to society as well, whether it be from stormwater control, uh, water purification, improving water quality uh, and whatnot. So here's a photo of the Fayetteville Springdale area in 1984. And then here it is, 2018. We've done a lot of growing during those years. And we'll probably continue to grow more into the decades to come. Here is Rogers and Bentonville in 1984. Here we are in 2018. 84, 2018. So what can we do as citizens? Well, we can prefer, preserve and enhance any wetlands that you have on your own property if you're lucky enough to happen to own a wetland. I wish I did. Uh, you could support local watershed groups such as the Beaver Watershed Alliance, Illinois River Watershed Partnership, and Ozark Water Watch. A lot of these are involved in uh, conservation efforts that uh, are meant to help improve water quality uh, and whatnot in these watersheds. <clears throat> so. Implement green infrastructure on your property, such as rain gardens and bioswells. Uh, advocate for wetland protection at planning commission meetings and then other public forums. So if you're aware of a wetland where uh, development may start to occur uh, or is uh, being threatened by development, it might be helpful to go advocate for the protection of that wetland. Uh, establish stream of what, well, what can local governments do? Well, we, they can establish stream of wetland protection programs such as protection ordinances, uh, zoning regulations that include wetland conservancy. Establish expert regulatory boards and advisory committees for wetlands. Adopt local real estate tax incentives for wetlands. Uh, there are places out east, uh, government, local governments that have real estate tax incentives for people that are doing things to restore and preserve and conserve wetlands on their properties. Uh, preserve and protect wetlands own local government lands such as parks, greenways, and forested areas, uh, or even restore and, and construct wetlands for pollution control, stormwater, or for parks and recreation. Osage Park is a great example of how uh, they use a naturally occurring wetland and turn it into an amenity uh, beyond the, the services it was already providing. Uh, they can implement green infrastructure and natural infrastructure projects such as rain gardens and bioswells on city property. So in case you're not familiar with these terms, what is green infrastructure? Well, these are engineered systems such as rain gardens, bioswells, and green roofs that mimic the natural, uh, the functions of natural systems such as wetlands. So think of a rain garden as like a little miniature wetland, a detention pond associated with a, net, uh, wet, uh, a um, residential development, uh, can be thought of as like a temporary miniature wetland. But if we were to vegetate these with, you know, more uh, better vegetation, natural wetland vegetation that's helping to break down contaminants, they could be so much more functional uh, than just by storing stormwater. I, mean, I see a lot of them, they're just, uh, you know, put lawn grass in them. And I just feel like they could be so much more than just grassy pits or swells. So 
Uh, green infrastructure provides localized flood control, uh, reduces the flow intensity of creeks during storm events. This is a bioswell in a parking lot uh, down the south uh, part of Fayetteville near the University of Arkansas. Um, bioswells also help improve water quality by filtering storm water. Uh, here's a picture of a bioswell that um, is over at the wastewater treatment plant on the west side of Fayetteville. And so whenever the rainwater stormwater runoff is flowing through this, that vegetation helps slow it down and that increases infiltration into the soil. Uh, and all the plants are able to do their thing where the roots are able to help facilitate the breakdown of contaminants. And this also helps recharge groundwater supplies. So here's an example of a rainwater and bioswell project that I uh, was involved with here at Crafton Toll along Beaver Lake. That's Beaver Lake in the background. Uh, this is a Hickory Creek Marina associated with the low impact development project that uh, we designed um, and partnered with the Beaver Watershed Alliance on. So the uh, included a rain garden. So here's a picture of the rain garden. Uh, these are vegetated uh, depressions designed to capture and slow down runoff and help reduce soil erosion allow more time for stormwater runoff to be absorbed by that soil. So whenever the rain garden starts to fill up too much, uh, we have this bioswell that's also helped, that when able to help uh, transfer the uh, runoff into the lake uh, through this, uh, the vegetation hasn't quite gotten established yet, but you can see where it's been planted along the sides there. So um, this will help slow down that stormwater runoff and allow more time for it to sink into the soil. So what are the benefits of natural infrastructure? Well, natural infrastructure approaches include forest, floodplain, and wetland protection, watershed restoration, and wetland restoration, and conservation easements. So uh, whenever you're utilizing this in conjunction with green infrastructure, uh, you can get these hybrid systems. Um, so that's, that's really, I think, you know, keeping what's already there, learning how to enhance it, learning how to work with nature, um, and we can avoid a lot of the you know, ill effects that we're already starting to see, hopefully avoid or at least mitigate or reduce the ill effects that we're starting to see from climate change. Natural infrastructure, so those healthy wetlands can provide many of the same benefits of traditional human made infrastructure at a much lower overall investment and maintenance cost. Unlike a traditional human made structures, a well-designed and maintained natural infrastructure project will not depreciate like an artificial system and in fact may actually increase in value over time. So they produce many ancillary benefits such as wildlife habitat, carbon sequestration, water filtration, groundwater storage, and floodwater attenuation. With that, I want to conclude my presentation by just giving a brief mention of the Society of Wetland Scientists. Uh, we're a professional organization that is here to help promote the understanding, conservation, protection, restoration, and science-based management and sustainability of wetlands. Uh, we produce uh, wetland research and also uh, try to educate the public through uh, the events, like I mentioned earlier, to help uh, with wetland conservation. So here is my uh, contact information. Uh, if you would like to reach out uh, to me via email or via telephone, uh, you're more than welcome to do so. And I will conclude my presentation there. Thank you so much, Eric. If anyone has any questions, um, you can put them in, into the chat. But um, since you were talking about like different stormwater solutions, I wanted to plug the program that you're doing for us in a few weeks in June. Um, I know you're doing it with a few other people. It's called Low Impact Development T Techniques. And I believe you're going to be talking about the different things that homeowners can do. And that's on Saturday, June 12th at two o'clock. So this will be focused on yeah, residential applications, low impact development techniques. And they, uh, uh, Lee Porter of Ozark Green Roofs and Jane Magnot, uh, the water quality agent for Washington County, uh, are we co-presenting on that one. And we'll be talking about everything from rain gardens to green roofs to rain barrels to different things homeowners can do to help uh, slow down, store, and help right stormwater soak into the soil. Yeah, great. Yeah, and let's see, I think everyone, I don't have any questions so far, just lots of thank yous, Eric. Um, yeah, I know that I don't feel like many people in Northwest Arkansas aren't affected by a lot of the flooding um that we've been having lately or with just uh, flash flooding not really just flooding right 
Yeah, I know my yard has suffered from it, so. Yeah, <laughs> I was driving around town and the, the day it was all coming down, just saw all the vehicles that were hydrolocked and stuck and yeah, it was, it was bad. Um, you know, I know down South Louisiana, they're having some bad flooding right now as well. You know, some of my relatives homes are getting uh, flooded, uh, yeah. damaged just from the heavy rains that are happening. Definitely. Climate change is changing. It's happening. It is. Um, oh, I had a question and then it just went right out of my mind. Maybe I'll think of it in just a second. Hmm. I'm filling in for Dr. Smith, so I probably won't be able to answer a lot of the, the carbon questions <laughs> that she probably would have been able to answer as <laughs> well as she could. But uh, so uh, okay. just, just filling in here. So go easy if you do have questions <laughs> and if not, then no worries. Yeah, well, I bet you know the answer to this one. How do we contact the Society for Wetland Prairie uh, Tours and do they have a website? What, the Society for Wetland, uh, Wetland Scientists? Yeah, I guess whichever society it was that offers the Wetland Prairie Tours. Uh, that was just kind of a, an annual event that uh, Jody Murray Burns of Cattails Environmental and myself were organizing. And we were starting to organize one last year uh, at Wilson Springs Preserve in conjunction with Northwest Arkansas Land Trust, uh, but due to COVID, we decided to, you know, call that off, uh, but hopefully uh, whenever things are able to open back up and we feel like we can hold these events without, you know, being a risk to public health, then maybe uh, we can start having these again. Uh, so I would just, uh, you could follow our Facebook page, um, or uh, Jody is the current president of the South Central Chapter. You can reach out to her and uh, but yeah, whenever we, we start holding these again, uh, we'll be putting out uh, advertisements for that event. Um, uh, other, there are other eco tours that happen now in other parts of the country, like South Louisiana. Uh, you can take kayak tours of wetlands, guided kayak tours. They have kayak trails in central Arkansas. Uh, you can take a kayak out to you know, the Bell Slough Wildlife Management Area, other swamp areas on your own. Um, <clears throat> But um, yeah, as far as the Society of Wetland Scientists, we, we were, we only had two of them. We, were, we had planned to make it an annual event, uh, but so far there, we've only had the two and then we had to stop, you know, this year and last year. So uh, hopefully those will resume, but it, the land trust, I mean, there's, uh, you can go out to some of their properties like Wilson Springs Preserve and High Ground anytime. Okay, thank you. As long as it's open, they do close it when it's closed. Okay. And then, and they can find the contact information on that Facebook page. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Our website is sws.org. If you wanted to check out our website, we do post it under events there. But hey, thank you, Eric. Well, if there aren't any more questions, I think we might be done for the afternoon. Let's see. Oh. Trudy gave some compliments to your five-year-old. Said she oh, made yes. <laughs> amazingly well. She did very, very good. You want to come say hi, Arrow? Yeah, I know she really wants to. She was as quiet as she possibly could be, and I'm so thankful she was as quiet as she was. So, <laughs> you wave to everybody. <laughs> she's been sticking it out this whole hour. <laughs> Thank you. you. Did very good. <laughs> had a reminder a few times but that's pretty normal for five. Oh yeah she's only five right <laughs> yeah, i'm lucky she's as patient as she, she says through board meetings with me i'm very fortunate so <laughs> great well if there aren't any more questions i think we're done thank you so much eric that was really great Definitely. Um, and yeah and thank you for such a great series that we've had so far so yep glad you enjoyed it so, Sign off here. I'll see you soon. All right. Thank you all.